All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. This is uh, Navigating the Venture Capital Gauntlet. Um, I'm happy to share with you today uh, mostly what I've learned through the hard way. <laughs> when I started out to raise uh, my first angel round in 1998, just to put a date on how old I am, um, I didn't know any of these things. And so through a lot of trial and tribulation, and I've raised a, quite a number of rounds at this point, I've learned a lot of things. And so what I'm really gonna try to share with you today is just a high level overview of the process, um, you know, kind of the basics, and not just from a raising money perspective, but from the venture capitalist perspective, so you can understand their perspective. Lots of things I've learned about their side of the world later on in life that uh, is really helpful if you know that going in. Um, we're gonna talk about sort of lots of terminology just to get you uh, uh, acquainted with. Um, we're gonna talk, spend a little bit of time talking about valuation and how valuation models go and how to think about it when you're doing a, your first raise and then later raises. Um, we'll talk about um, different kinds of deal structures. Um, and uh, I, I got some follow-up stuff I can give everybody when we're done, if you'd like, on that front. Um, we're gonna talk about your cap table specifically. This is one of those things I had no idea about when I first started. And I see now a lot of early stage companies that sort of get this screwed up early, which really challenges your business, your opportunity to raise money later. We talk about option pools, um, how much money to raise from what kind of parties, and then uh, a little bit about just how the whole process works. I, I think this is 45 minutes or so of material. I mean, I'm happy to stop for questions anywhere along the way or at the end, and we'll just make it as uh, interactive as possible. Um, so, venture capital, it's a form of financing that is provided to small early stage emerging firms they are deemed to have high growth potential, which have demonstrated and, and or which have high, demonstrated high growth. Um, you know, the, the world of raising money has changed dramatically. Just to give you a sense, my first angel round I um, raised in 98 and 99 time frame for a business that had a single customer and that customer was American Express, so I don't want to trivialize that, but we raised $2 million as our first angel round. That doesn't happen anymore. The world has changed, and it's changed for some good reasons. It doesn't cost as much money to do things as it used to out of the gate. The cloud environments and, and operating systems and everything's so much cheaper. So a lot of reasons it doesn't change. It, it, you don't need that kind of money. Um, you know, you, so there's all kinds of different sources of money and friends and family. It's very common people start with, you know, raising money from friends and family. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And angel investors, which is your early first angel round, as they, they describe it, uh, that, that's a world that's changed and its changes depend on where you are geographically. Uh, there are individuals that work together as angels. There's angel groups and super angels, which almost start to look more like early stage venture capitalists. There's venture capital, which has also dramatically changed. All of the firms that I raised my first venture, uh, venture capital round are still in business. They still call themselves venture capital, uh, but they don't do anything even close to what you, we think of as early stage anymore. And that, not that there are others that haven't stepped into the earlier stages, but venture capital is a very different than it was, has been in, in times past in terms of what it is. You know, I meet venture capital folks and talk about what kind of deals they do, and they want you know two million of positive EBITDA, five years of operating experience, and you know I'm like, okay, well that's not exactly venture by my stretch. Um, private equity, which is kind of the step above, and then we'll touch on just crowdsource capital. I'm not going to spend a lot on the crowdsource stuff. That's also dramatic, you know, very rapidly changing world. Um, just in the last year, we've changed, seen some significant change there. Anybody that's interested in pursuing that, I'm happy to talk about that separately, um, you know, offline or, or as a follow-up. Um, so let's talk about venture capitalist perspective a little bit, because it's important to think about what they're looking at uh, when they put, um, when they're analyzing deals. Um, first of all, nine out of ten investments they make are going to fail. That's a really bad rate which means the ones that they do hit have to really be big home runs. And so, you know, as diligent and as uh, um, uh, hard it is that they look through to ensure success, their failure rate is very high. Um, 
some things you need to know. What fund are they investing out of? So any real serious venture capital group has, um, they raise a fund and it can be 50 million, 100 million, um, you know, you see venture funds are a billion now. And so when they have a fund, they go raise all that money from um, the, the limiteds, the guys that are investing in that. Um, there's constraints on what they can do with that fund, how much money they can put into an, an existing investment, how much they reserve for follow-on investments, and is the fund fully invested or early on invested. And where they are in the life of a fund changes the way they think about investments. Um, there's a group in town here that I'm pretty familiar with that is on the very end of their investment fund one, means they can maybe do one more investment, but they're not going to do any more a really early stage investment in that fund because the life of the fund is almost fully invested. Now, if they have a $100 million fund fully invested, maybe 50 or 60 million because they're saving money for follow-on investments. The other thing that you think you need to know about funds is a lot of they may have multiple funds in operation and there's this cross fund thing. If, I've, if I invested you in fund one and it's fully vested, invested now and I have another opportunity or need to invest in your business and I'm in fund two now, I may have constraints that say I can't, I can't invest in you from fund two because you're invested in fund one. And so there's lots of rules that are going on behind the scenes in a venture capitalist world that is important to know. You know, so the kinds of things you want to know about them is how big is their fund, what is the size and stage that they invest in, how invested is the fund, how they think about follow-on investments. Almost every, if you put a business plan in front of a venture capitalist that says you're raising $2 million and that's going to get you cash flow positive, it doesn't matter. They don't believe that because it's probably not true to start with and they're always going to reserve additional dollars to invest in follow-on rounds. Um, they have to do that um, because, well, the other reason they do it is if they can't, if your business takes off, let's say, you, let's plan the success, your business really takes off, now you want to raise more money to grow quicker, if they're going to, they want to be able to participate in that because if they don't, they may get squeezed down, they, they may get uh, pushed down from other investors. So there's lots going on in the dynamics there. Um, limiteds. That's a term that gets thrown that those are the people that invest in the venture capital funds. So they tend to be big retirement funds. Um, you know, California has one of the largest, most powerful. And these guys have to go do the same thing, right? They have to go raise money from limiteds to put into their fund and they have to show good returns for those limiteds so they can come back and invest in the second fund. Um, full, fully invested in cross fund investing. So I've touched on both of those things. What are they looking for? This is in order, I would say. Team first. They most importantly want to invest in people that have track records, that they have confidence they can do achieve this. Um, the idea, how unique is it? Do you have intellectual property? Are there patents? How defendable is the position? Um, and then you get into what is the plan look? What's the financial model? How's the thing gonna scale? and the operating plan, and then, and then last is sort of valuation. How is the valuation? And I'm gonna talk about that more. But, you know, team is really important. It doesn't mean you have had to have been there and done that before. If you have, you have a lot better, uh, easier time of going and doing this. Um, but, you know, what kind of experience do you have that leads up to this and your likelihood of being successful? Because again, everything that a venture capitalist is looking at is trying to make a bet on the people that are most likely going to succeed. Um, and so your track record behind that, behind that what kind of advisors you've uh, um, uh, surrounded yourself with, and uh, you know, what relative experience. Um, why your model is wrong. Your model is wrong. <laughs> it's just all there is to it. I always say, even when I do budgets to this day, I can tell you only one thing with certainty. Whatever the numbers are at the end of the year, you're, they're not going to be these. Um, what, a, what a VC will do in looking at your model is they'll play with your assumptions like crazy. They'll cut your revenue expansions in half, they'll double the, the operating expense. Uh, um, they'll look at all kinds of scenarios um, to really kind of look at the weaknesses. Um, so the, you, you know, the more you've spent into doing that yourself, um, you know, the kinds of businesses I've been in tend to be you know, B2B, 
enterprise um, sales organizations. And the best way to model those is based on salespeople productivity. I know a salesperson can sell X, and therefore if I have 10 of them selling X, and they're you know, at 80% of plan or 60% of plan, this is what the revenue equations are. A lot of consumer models are um, not as easily to make formulaic, um, but things that, but I, you know, one of the things I would discourage you, if your model says I'm gonna capture 10% of market share, uh, no, I, and how are you gonna do that, right? It, you, th there is, there's a lot of things to, to drill down when you think about the modeling aspect of how is it really logistically gonna happen? How many orders do I have to take a month? Or how many subscribers do I have to sign up a month? How many does that mean a day? What does that mean to my operational business? So a lot of things about how the business scales and the financial model uh, matter, but whatever you do, it'll be wrong. So let's talk about valuation a little bit um, and what drives valuation. So, you know, we see all the news about Facebook or Twitter or, you know, Box or any of these uh, giant companies with these Uber, you know, these crazy valuations. And that's true, and those things happen. One in a million. So most evaluation is really tied to very fundamental things. And first is EBITDA. You know, it's a cash flow measure. How much money does your comp is your company going to produce? And then, like any public company or any other company, your valuation is a multiple of that. In a private company world, I would tend to say it's six or seven times that. Um, you know, there's things that... There are, there are lots of things down here below that will sort of affect the multiple of your EBITDA. But EBITDA is one first. And, and so any kind of financial model you have has EBITDA in it. Um, EBITDA and net income look a lot more like if you don't have a capital intensive business, but, but I, I'm just an EBITDA guy. Uh, revenue is another one. So we can value, a lot of businesses have a lot of loss in the early part. And so how do you value a business against a multiple EBITDA if there is no EBITDA? Then we look at revenue as a multiple. Um, and even these companies, um, you know, high growth companies tend to look at revenue. And these things tie together. So um, how quick revenue grows has a multiplying effect on what your multiple of EBITDA is. So if you're growing at exponentially just huge rates, then you get sort of a, you, you can look at it. And it's really a function of looking at forward EBITDA is going to be that much greater. But That'll drive it. So revenue is a, a number, but revenue growth rate and EBITDA tie together. What's the gross margin of the business? So software businesses tend to have really, really high gross margins and therefore have better valuations. Um, equipment sales business, product sales businesses tend to have lower margins. They're non-reoccurring revenue, and by definition, they have a much lower valuation. I have a good friend of mine, um, I shouldn't name the company, that runs a, let's call it a, a, an equipment business that's in the technology world, they sell servers and all kinds of, uh, you know, they're a billion three in revenue and they have a, you know, they're not worth a billion three as a business. Um, I know companies that are doing 100 and 200 million dollars in revenue that are worth a billion because they're software and they have very high gross, mar gross margins. Uh, uniqueness of the product. So what, you know, you, you'll always a VC is going to look at your business to say, how easy is this to replicate? You know, what is it that you have that's really unique and defendable? You know, a lot of folks like to point to, I've got first mover advantage. I'm the first guy in the space. And there's some validity to that. If you can get big enough and establish a brand, then that works. Um, but if you're first mover and it's a software thing that I could put 10 guys in a room and knock off, then first mover ain't necessarily going to help you in any regard. Um, if you have a really unique, um, uh, you know, if you got, uh, patents are always great. If you've got patented technology, that helps make it defendable. If you've got really complex uh, software code, if you've been you know, developing algorithms for years and, you know, you've got six PhDs in a room that have built something that nobody else is easily going to replicate, again, that helps. Um, scalability. I met with a guy yesterday who was in here at Digital Ignition looking at how you might help with this. You know, it, it, so many companies now these days are started by young folks that are, you know, great software programmers and, but haven't lived through a business that really, really scales. And, you know, ultimately in a software world, you're talking about, 
you know, geographically redundant cloud implementations that, you know, cross failover and, you know, database architectures that are clean and scale, you know, there's lots of things that happen as a business gets bigger. And if you haven't lived it, the ones that are most critical are those you'd never have experienced before. So there's going to be a lot of thought about how well does this business scale because at the end of the day, for the VC to get their money back, you're going to have to get pretty darn big and usually pretty quickly. Um, so thinking about that and how you scale a business and what kind of people you're going to need and what kind of partners you're going to need and what kind of infrastructure you're going to need is, again, key to the model. It's key to the credibility of the business and it's key to the valuation. Um, and, you know, as a supporter to that would be standardization, documentation, and process. I got really sort of lucky. Um, I've been lucky a lot, actually. Um, I, in the early stage of my first startup, I happened to, you know, we were going through some really crazy growth, and I just happened to hire a guy to run sales who brought a guy with him from GE who was a GE black belt. And, you know, um, good guy, and boy, did he put my investors at, at ease because he brought a whole new level of structure and process and thought about how we do defects and how we correct processes. So, you know, those kinds of things at the right time can really help. Market positioning and brand recognition. You know, we did a, a, a seminar like this that you can see online earlier about brand. Um, you know, brand can really matter. Um, and brand cannot matter. And, and what I say by that, if you're in a B2B world, I've grown some pretty big businesses that people never heard of, um, you know, and competed against companies like AT&T and Verizon and such. Um, if you're in a consumer space, brand matters. If you're an app, brand matters. And how you position and how recognizable your name can be can really add to valuation. I mean, Google and Uber and, you know, these names have become so commonly understood I had, to, I had to go through a name change um, at the beginning of my startup. We were originally called Telecommute Solutions because we were in the telecommuting space. Turned out you couldn't service mark that. And um, WorldCom Ventures was my lead investor. They hated the name. And so the first thing I had to do was change the name. And it was ironic because we changed at the same time Verizon which was Bell Atlantic at the time, changed their name to Verizon. And we, the name we can't wound up coming up was, was called Netifis. And, um, you know, Netifis was sort of the concatenation of network and office, and that represented what telecommuting was. That's not how the name came from. It really came from Edifis is the building we go to in the future. Network is what we'll go to. We'll call it Netifis. At the same time, Verizon came out, and I, I remember the time going, I can't even pronounce what the hell that is. I think we did a better job, but of course, hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising later, everybody knows Verizon, and so, um, uh, you know, market positioning is a thing by itself, and, and depending on what your space is, if you're in the B2B world, then things like Forrester and Gartner can matter. Um, I was fortunate in my company to get positioned in the leadership quadrant in a brand new sort of space that they was newly defined back in the time when I was a very small company and that got us a lot of credibility in the marketplace. So depending on what space you're in, how you define a market positioning matters. So the why is evaluation. Um, when an investor looks at a business and how they're going to value it, it, to be honest, the early valuation, your angel round or your first venture round, that's more art and kind of what the temperature, you know, what direction is the wind blowing then. And I'll talk about that. I've got some examples. Then it is real science. I mean, I, I've done a lot of M&A work in my life. M&A is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's a, you know, there's, you look at growth, you look at cash flow, and you've got a multiple on that, depending on what the space is, and that's the value of the business. You can argue reasons why it's up or less, but it's sort of fundamental. In the early stage venture world, it's a lot more, you know, looking forward and what is the business going to be worth down the road and what piece of that business do I want to own in the beginning. But at the end of the day, you know, it's about cash flow ultimately. Even these crazy, crazy, you know, uh, Ubers of the world, it, it's still ultimately about what that business is going to produce. I mean, if you look at the history of a Google or an Amazon, they went for years and years and years of not making money. But ultimately, the valuation settles into what it's going to produce in terms of 
of cash flow. And that, of course, is what drives the internal rate of return from a, from a venture's um, capitalist perspective. And ultimately, that is about scalability. How big can it get? And, and the trick to raising money, and I'm going to show you this in the valuation, you know, you got to be careful because if, an in, if a venture guy is looking for a 10x return on his money, the more money you raise, the bigger the nut you're going to have to return. And sometimes, you know, it's not about the most money raised, it's about delivering a solid return. Now, again, depending on the venture capitalist, the other issue they have, and this is really important to understand too, depending on the size of their fund, it has a lot to dictate what they can invest in. So if I have a $100 million fund, then I'm probably looking at putting, you know, million to five million at work in a deal. If I got a billion dollar fund, I can't get there putting a million to five million to work. I got to put 10 to 50 to work. And therefore, I can't look at deals. It may be the greatest thing since sliced bread, but if they're looking for five million, it's just not enough for me to work. Because like selling or like any, a lot of other things in business, a deal takes a certain amount of work. And if it's a $1 million investment, if it's a $10 million investment, if it's a $100 million investment from a VC's perspective, it's a still a base amount of work. And so you really need to understand sort of you know, how big the fund is. And, and these things that anybody will answer, but, but um, and raising more money means you gotta deliver better returns. So um, revenue be predictable. So I mean, again, I'm gonna beat this like a dead horse, I, you, you want predictability. That's, you know, it's a really strange thing that you go, they're in the venture world, there isn't anything predictable. That's right, but they're still gonna work really hard to go, how predictable do I think this can be? And so again, things that you can demonstrate that have been successful. So if you're in the B2C world and you're in a, some kind of app or some kind of web business, if you can run on a really small scale, um, you know, a ad campaign or a pay-per-click or a Facebook promotion and say I put a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to work and I got this kind of sign up then it's not hard to say if I did that 10x I will have 10x the same return if you're in a B2B world if I can put a sales guy on the street and he can sell this much stuff then I can go okay if I could put 10 guys on the street in 10 different markets they could do the same and so those are the kinds of things that we look at in terms of why a business is going to be predictable and why it'll scale. Um, um, is, more, is more aggr aggressive growth achievable? I and mean, there's some businesses that are going to be really good businesses, but they're never going to be really big businesses. And so if I'm a venture guy, I may look at your business and go, with absolute certainty, you're going to succeed. You're just not going to succeed big enough to make it worth me putting the money in. Or I may think you have a really good chance of succeeding, but you have a really good chance of being a good, okay, medium kind of business, and therefore I'm not going to lose my money, but I'm comparing you against 10 other things I'm looking at, and which one is the likely, I may invest in one that has less likely to succeed, but the, if it does succeed, it succeeds so much bigger that I'm going with that one instead of yours. Um, how much of the systems and processes are already in place? So, you know, a lot of times, especially in the early stage, we see stuff that is, you know, of course, if you haven't read, you should read the, um, uh, I'll think of the book, A Lean Startup, right? And it's all about minimal viable product. Can I get a minimal viable product? Because that's validation in the marketplace, but if all I've got is minimal viable product with validation in the marketplace, that doesn't necessarily say my business will scale. And so in this day and age, I'm a big fan of that concept because you'll learn a lot by having a market a product in the marketplace, but then what a lot of times that product won't scale. And so you're gonna have to think about how you get there. So if I'm looking at an investment and looking at valuation, how much money do I have to put into this thing just to get it so it'll ready to scale versus how ready it is it to scale today? Um, <clears throat> sometimes when we look at these things, you know, there are a lot of businesses that have um, been out there, hard knocks, have gotten customers, gotten traction, um, but that was sort of started a point where their technology is, you know, they duct tape and bob wire and have it running and the new guy can show up with the latest and greatest and get there faster. And so sometimes, 
you know, it's the last group that comes in um, is, as a competitive threat. This company, Convergent, that housed here is in that world very much. There, there's so many software providers and a lot of the guys, large established guys, platforms are just not nearly as flexible and as dynamic as the newer guys. The other thing about this is um, the other trick to investing, and this is again why people reserve money, often it's the last guy in that makes the return. There's a lot of money that goes into an early stage deal and, and especially angel guys, if this thing's going to take two or three rounds, the first couple guys may not be able to hang there. And, and so, you know, it's very common that the smart money is the last money in when things are much more developed. And so you see these later stage guys that are looking for positive EBITDA on positive traffic records. They may reset the bar and valuation, be in, because now it's ready. They may bring their own talent in to help support and off the race as it goes. Um, unicorns. <laughs> you know, normal rules don't apply. Um, you, EBITDA value, it's about, you know, market share and subscriber growth and crazy things that make no sense to anybody. But these are very rare. I, I mean, it's just, I could name 10 on my hands maybe. It, it is, you know, and I'm not saying don't go for that. Just you got to understand it, it's, a, it's such a rare thing that you can't say, hey, I'm going to be the next Facebook. And if you really look at what Facebook or a Google or an Uber has now in infrastructure, you know, their own data centers, you know, millions of servers, hot, you know, crazy technology underlying that scalability, it doesn't happen without raising a lot of money. And so a lot of money goes into that kind of platform, which is dilutive to all the investors. And so even if they think, hey, I can give this guy $100,000 and he's going to be the next Uber, that didn't necessarily mean, you know, it's going to be such a great bet. Okay, so let's talk about valuation. Um, you know, th th this is a tricky thing. And I, I, I say this in that, you know, people get a little too caught up on this because, you know, I want to get the best valuation I can. And I would tell you, not necessarily, you know, I would always say focus more on the quality of the investor. You want good people sitting around the table that are going to be supportive of your business, that are going to understand your business, that have things they can bring of value in relationships or knowledge. Um, and I would take that over a better valuation any day of the week. Um, there are crazy deals that get done with crazy valuations out there and usually because they're unsophisticated investors. So, you know, you have some guy that um, ran a printing pl company and he started it as, you know, it was, it was his dad's business. He took over and now he's incredibly wealthy and he's going to give you a million dollars and you're going to have a $10 million valuation out of the gate and he's only taking 10% of the company. It's all in common and that's really great and he doesn't know what he's doing. And so the next round you've got to raise, okay, nobody's going to pay you at the $10 million valuation. He's in trouble. Um, so valuation is a tricky kind of thing. Now, if you're a VC, if you're an actual venture capitalist, there's a couple of things going on. I want to have enough of the business to, to be meaningful, but I need you as the founder to still have a you know, vested interest too. And so if I cram you down too much, then I take away your incentive. But if I don't take enough, I don't have the return upside. So it's much more of a dance than it is a, a, a formulaic kind of thing. And I'll show you that. I mean, I often think about, and, and I'm going to give you a scenario that's a real scenario of a company I worked with to contemplate and have discussion about raising money that when they were, went out to raise, they'd never raised money before, they were doing $2 million in revenue and they were sort of breaking even. I, I, I can tell you, I can go raise $5 million for that, I can go raise $10 million for that, and it's not going to be a much different effort. It's the same kind of work. And the question is, can they put the money to work? In fact, I could argue that if the money can really be put to work, 10 million is easier to raise. A million is the hardest of all, right? Million dollar, and I'll, I'll get to this later, but there are, there are sort of zones. Angels do 100,000 to a million, or a couple of them will get together to do that. Uh, VCs kind of do these days two to five million. If you're in the million range, and, I, and good grief, if I had a dollar for everybody that came to me and said, we're gonna go raise a million bucks. It's the hardest number. So in this case, 
I could argue that the, the, they, these guys could have raised $5 million or they could have raised $10 million, and in either case, they would have been given up the same amount of the company. Because it isn't about as much what they're valued right now, it's more about what they're going to be valued in the future. Um, so what happens often is you raise this amount of money. If you, in this case, we raised five million bucks. That by debt for 50% of the company, therefore it defines the other half was worth five million too. And then we got to create this incentive pool. Everybody takes a hit, or sometimes they'll make that come out of the founder's share. So we create this incentive pool. Those tend to run 10 to 20% because we want to be able to give options to employees. And so we have a post money. In this case, we sort of took that out of each other's share. And so in that case, if you look at it that way, and this, I did this, my first uh, venture round was like this. We put 18% into the option pool and literally every check that the investors wrote was already worth less because they ponied in options to the option pool. Um, in this case, so their investors and founders are both left with 42%. Management's incentive is 15%. Um, and, and so that, I've said that. So let me show you kind of how this plays out in some scenarios. Now, these were actual revenue models that I helped these guys put together to contemplate what raising money would entail. So this was where they were operating, $2 million in revenue and the cost of sales, and they were sort of breaking even. And we looked at sort of a five-year plan if they just did it organically. And so in this case, they you know, got up to $10 million in, 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 um, in uh, 2016 was the forecast. And this kind of shows their valuation on basic multiples. So you know, uh, pre-money there is not real because this, this company would not be valued at that, but that is for these next two scenarios, really. Um, so in this case, if they could pull this off, they would create a business worth in the neighborhood of 11 to $12 million. Um, and this was a model that was driven based on sales productivity. This is a cloud services company and they knew a sales guy could sell so much and so on and so forth. So then here's, the, here's a scenario where we say, okay, we're gonna raise five million per, that, per slide. So five million, management throws this equity pool together. So we start off at a $12 million valuation just based on that. But when we go into the next year already, we're gonna lose money. And so that valuation's not real, right? It takes a dip right out of the gate. Um, and then has to, we go three years of execution before we get to sort of where we started. And at the end of the day, then we really crank up here. And, and that's a function of reoccurring revenue business, sales productivity grows, we're putting this money to web. So if, we, so if you think about it, I put five million to work, I gotta work, they gotta execute well for three years just to get kind of where I was to start with, and therefore two years. Now, an investor would probably not do it this deal this way, given this, they'd probably want more of the company. But if we go to the $10 million scenario, it's the same kind of thing you know, they, we just say for sake of discussion, they want founders to have a meaningful piece. And, and so it, it goes it's even worse, right? Now I've, I've got a post deal at $24 million. I'm negative three in year one. So I'm, I'm, I'm four years out now before I get back to whole. So that's my point here partially is if you think about how much money you're gonna raise, the growth dynamic you have to deliver to get really even back to even from a valuation perspective and then start to deliver a return, it can become intimidating at, at least. And what's interesting, if we look at these in comparison then, so these are the sort of, this is the, the valuation exits for the founders or the, or the um, cause they had the same uh, for the investors. In the five million scenario of that, the investors got a five X return and the 10 million, they only got a four X return. So you go, wow, I took a company from zero to almost $100 million in revenue, uh, or 60 million there, 100 million valuation. And I still didn't deliver as good a return as if I didn't grow as much with less money. And so these are the kind of things the guys are thinking about here. What is the upside? And that's why I say, how well will the business scale? If you look at this business here, if I go back, you know, starting from two million and go to 10 million, that was almost, I mean, the stars and the moon would have to align and 75 and sunny every day. I mean, I, it just was such a far stretch that nobody's really gonna buy into that. And therefore, that's gonna be half that and this has to be bigger and it just all starts to come, become much more intimidating. 
this is the disclosure side. These numbers will vary. <laughs> you know, this was for comparison's sake and, and just to think about it. There are many things that, that affect valuation. Now, what I got wrong in that past scenario, because my numbers are wrong like everybody else's numbers are wrong, is if I was growing at that rate to hit the $60 million inside that time, I would get a better multiple valuation than I would if I was the five million guy. So there's some things that aren't probably terribly accurate there. But again, there's so much risk. Um, um, you know, financial, I mean, I, I had the lovely pleasure of my first institutional round I raised was, I closed in January of 2000. I raised $19 million on top of the angel round I'd done a year and a half before, closed in January in 2000. Well, for those that are in this room that are too young, and you're plenty of you, um, Dot com implosion happened a year later, and 9/11 um, happened not that long after that. And I had to, you know, and, and Worldcom Ventures was, was my lead investors. They went bankrupt and went away. I had lots of things to go through, and I survived all that. Ran on to run that business until it was profitable and such, and then tried to retire. And I got put in to do a turnaround. Um, it was private equity backed and had $80 million sitting there to be put to work in, business, in this business, was already doing 60 million in revenue. I joined that company in the beginning of 2008. So at the end of that year, we had the financial meltdown. And so, you know, I got this great track record of stepping into these things just before these horrific um, world things happen. But they do happen. If you're gonna be in a business for five to 10 years, it is likely you're gonna go through some significant events. And so these guys are gonna think about it. And there's for why I say, you know, it's often comparable to getting married only without the divorce option. You take private equity in, in any form, and that is a partnership where it, it's very intrusive. These are not people that, you know, give you money and then, oh, well, and move on the way. I mean, they, they want to get their returns. So they're going to be in your stuff in a meaningful way. Now, at the same time, I've been lucky because, I mean, I had investors that knew my space and knew in spite of difficulties we went through, were very supportive, could bring relationships and, and really help. And that's why I say, you're gonna go through hard times. I would always err to have better folks around the table than just the money. Um, um, you know, the bigger, the more money you raise, the bigger the, the returns, the, the bigger the growth you have to achieve to deliver it. You know, what I, what I should have said at the beginning, and um, I, I'll just put it here, if you cannot raise money, don't raise it. it, it, it you, everybody that I talk to, and I know some of the guys I know that have had the wealthiest exits, didn't have giant businesses, but didn't raise money either. I have a very good friend of mine sold his business for $36 million to Xerox, and he had raised some friends and family money at all. He put a lot of that in his pocket. I have, um, I've seen guys that raise, that run businesses from startup to $200 million and didn't take anything meaningful away. So it isn't necessarily about raising money and we get caught up in the effort to go raise money because it's cool. And if you can get by without raising money, don't. And um, you know, a, a reasonable um, uh, Cummings here in town that did part of it, sold it for 96 million bucks. They had raised some money, but not a lot, and therefore he's a very wealthy guy. So you know, there's a lot about how to go do it, and but don't do it if you can get a buy without it, um, and or postpone it as long as you can. The, the, you know, there's a joke about banking, and bankers want to give you money when you don't need to borrow it. Venture capitalists are that same same exact way. They are really interested in your business when you don't really need their money and they're not uh, terribly interested when you're desperately needing their money. And so to the extent that you can get to a position where you know, you're, on, you're really looking at raising money to facilitate accelerated growth, but you're already having a success, that's the sort of best scenario. Um, you know, they're gonna want board seats, they're gonna want all kinds of controlling um, capabilities, they may want other people of their um, you know, advisory board seats and, and their folks on the management team. Lots of demands that investors may have of you. Um, you know, it's also there can be tremendously helpful. I mean, they can open doors, they can provide resources. Um, you know, good venture capitalists uh, tend to have, they all have sort of different kind of views of this, but they tend to have 
resources that they make available to their investors to help, um, help them be successful. Um, I, I'll also say, you know, as smart as they seem, there'll be a day where you'll have a conversation you go, oh my God, they don't understand what we're doing at all. They, 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 you know, it's a difficult world. You're trying to understand a lot of businesses at some level. And, and these are smart folks, don't get me wrong, but they're not operating people. And the good ones know they're not operating people. Uh, but there will be aspects of parts of your business they don't understand. I have this, what I call habit now, called unit economics. Whenever I'm trying to develop a presentation for a VC, I try to boil it down to one. If I sold one widget, what is the cost of the widget to deliver? What's the revenue opportunity of the widget to deliver? And, and really looking at it in very simple forms. And I do that because I've pitched to so many VCs over the year, I understand they don't understand complexity. Um, you know, I'll pick on Trendbrew a little bit. They got a really complicated business with lots of different revenue sources. It's a really hard concept to explain to VCs. And given the number of deals they're looking at, it's really easy for a VC, ah, that may be really good, I just don't understand it, and so I'm gonna move on to the next one. So um, keeping it as simple as possible is important too. Um, and, and again, you know, if you pick the right ones, there's a lot they can do. This is true too, if you're down the road with boards, if, you can put a, if you're putting a board, direct, a board of directors together or an advisory board, you don't want people just because they're really cool names. You want people because they can actually add value. Um, you know, it is going down this path probably means you're going to lose control. It, it, you know, you raise enough money, you're not going to have controlling interest that the company anymore. It is happens. You, you Mark Zuckerberg still has controlling interest of Facebook more or less, but it, that's again crazy, bizarre uh, rule. And again, bigger returns. So let's talk about forms, structures, and terms. So there's really two different ways a venture deal gets done. There, well, there's three different ways here. We'll talk about all three. So a straight investment in common. You have a company, and like, we just decide as a group we're going to create a company today. We have 100 shares. We're going to go raise $4 million, and we're going to sell 40% of the company. They buy common shares. We're all in the same pool. Um, that is one way, uh, not, not as common as you'd expect. More typical, although a little less so than back in my early days, is preferred. See, investors go, no, 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 I'll, I'll, you can keep control 60%, I'll give you the four million, but I get a pref, they call it for short. And the pref can be, I get my money back first. So if we sold the company for eight million bucks, I get my four back. Uh, back in the dot-com era, it would be a 3x or a 4x. You literally, I think I did my first deal that the investors had a 3x pref. So I raised $19 million, and they get 60 before I get anything back. So it's an important under thing to understand in the cap table what you raise because, you know, what the ultimate outcome, if there's a lot of preference, and you can have tiered pref if you run raise multiple rounds. The first guys may have a 1x. The next guys may come on top, and they have a 2x on top of the 1x, so the first guy gets his money, then the second guy gets his money times two, and before money comes down to the, sh the management and the option pools, there's all kinds of crazy things that can be stacked in front of you. Um, <coughs> and it's, you know, <coughs> it's back to your negotiating leverage. If you're early stage and you need the money and you, you know, then you're much more likely to have to give up these things. If you're cranking and you're just looking for money to accelerate growth, then you have a lot better negotiating position and you're much less likely to have to give the kind of crazy pref. Convertibles. Um, <clears throat> I'm not, so this is a very common thing in Atlanta, I know for sure. And there are people that love it and only do it that way and there are people that don't. Um, and I, there's, People that are passionate about this on both sides of the fence, and I don't really, I mean, I can defend either side. A convertible is really, I think, a pretty good vehicle for your first, you know, if you're really looking an angel round. And the reason is, is because it sort of steps aside of the valuation issue. And so the way a convertible works is, we say we're going to go raise an angel round of 500,000 bucks, and that's going to get us, you know, 12 months 
of operating performance. And um, by then, we're going to need to raise a real round, let's call it two or three million dollars. So what we do is we write a, a, a note, it's like a loan for $500,000 that is convertible into the first A round at a discount, typically. So it says, I'm going to get, I'm going to give you $500,000 and I am going to convert this into equity when you close your Series A round and I get 15% discount for what those guys pay. Um, what's good about it is it, 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 it sort of moves the whole, kicks the can down the road in terms of valuation. We have to worry about a lot of discussion about valuation now and I have a, I have a, a, a incentive to do it now because I get a discount with the later guys. The later guys are expected to be a more sophisticated or experienced investor group so they're going to set a fair valuation. That's going to be based on our performance and so it's kind of all good. Now the downside from you as the as the founders or the, the owners of the business, there still has to be some valuation set because if you don't get that raised round, then there's what the, does it convert or what are the terms if, if you take longer and all those kinds of things. And those are usually reasonably punitive. I mean, it's not, you know, the downside scenarios are, are tricky here. Um, if anybody, um, once, and I think I owe you guys a version of this already. I've got a template version of this that I'm happy to share with you uh, that's a legally drafted, it's a very sort of standardized version of this. Uh, and I'll give, you a con I'll give you one that you can have as a starting place and use as a term sheet. Um, you know, I, I personally, there are, there are plenty of angels that hate them. There are plenty of angels that love them. And I, I can't tell you why people are one side or the other, but, but, but it's a very common thing in, the, in town. Up rounds, down rounds, and follow on rounds. So again, this is somewhat just to understand terminology. It is more than likely if you go down this path, you're going to raise additional rounds through time. And so the question becomes, is it an up round? And that means the valuation has increased from what your previous round does, or is it a down round? which was the scenario you get the wealthy uncle gives you a million dollars for 10% of your company, you know, I, I don't care why they do it, that sets the value at $10 million. And now you're gonna go raise two million more and somebody goes, well this business, I'm only gonna value it at five million bucks. Then the first guy in got squeezed down. That's a down round. Um, I had to do a down round. I had to do a flush basically. So I raised a $19 million round from WorldCom, Vent WorldCom Ventures, HIG, Boston Millennium Partners, and Columbia Capital. They were all more or less even, um, um, WorldCom was the largest. Fast forward two years later, we need to raise another round and WorldCom is going through bankruptcy. They obviously couldn't invest. And so I almost lost the whole thing. We, we almost got just sort of flushed because it was too, um, too crazy and WorldCom was a distraction. And so what we wound up doing, it, it's funny, I got, the good news through all that time is we kept beating our numbers and we kept growing the plan and we were still losing money but a whole lot less than expected. And so I had one of my investors go, well to hell with this, we'll invest by ourselves. And it was an interesting dynamic because they liked what we were doing and so they were gonna re, we were basically gonna value the company at zero so we flush all equity, take in a new round, and they were going to have, you know, 80% of the business. And so for this investor, he's going, hey, look, I got a chance to get this company that survived all these horrible times on the cheap because I can flush all this other money and restart it. Of course, as soon as he said they do that, then the other two investors I had go, no, 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 not so fast. Um, I went in on that deal, and so we wound up taking the three investors flushing the thing to zero, bringing in new investors to start over, reissuing new option programs, and literally starting the clock from, from ground zero. So down rounds aren't, I mean, that was not fun. I don't recommend it for anybody, you know, but um, it, it, they can be useful. And so anybody that has any sophistication in investing, they, they know these things are possible. And so, you know, the, again, another dy dynamic to, to uh, understand. Um, Follow on rounds. I mean, that's just a, we did this round, we do another round, and we do another round. They're almost always, I, I have very rarely seen businesses don't do multiple rounds. I've seen millions of businesses that say they're never going to need any more money. Um, but the problem with that assumption is even success 
drives the need for more cash. I mean, I, you, you have nearby news guys, if, they, if their business takes off and they go crazy viral, the server infrastructure, the, you know, there's just lots of things that are cost money to scale quickly. So inevitably, you're going to need follow-on rounds. Cram down. That's what another version of what I just described I've been through. Managing your cap table. Everybody know what a cap table is? Okay, so a cap table simply says, it's a table that says, here's what everybody owns. And it's fully, you know, it includes options and warrants and every kind of stock vehicle you can grant. If they all turned into stock, this is what everybody owns as a percentage. Um, the, the biggest issue becomes is, is people do crazy things. You're bootstrapping your company and you give some stock to the guy to do a logo and you give the guy to the printer and you give your mom some and you, you, this guy gave you 10,000 bucks so you give him some stock setting a price maybe when you didn't. Next thing you know you got 22 investors in your business and you're going out to raise your first round and, and investors looking at your business to invest and they're gonna give you a million bucks for 40 percent and then you got another 40 percent that's got grandma and everybody and their uncle in there no I don't want to do that I mean if you got lots of investors in your deal out too early you're gonna right out scare out any later investors and so it's really really important to keep this as clean as possible now the guy I referenced earlier that sold his company to Xerox the, uh, I mean, the guy that, in, now he didn't raise a lot of money. He did almost all this with some very small, close, uh, friendly investors. Um, the guy that did his logo did wind up getting about half a million dollars for that work uh, six years later. But um, so keep it very simple. Um, um, you know, it's also um, keeping good count of this. I mean, you got to have. Um, you, you've got to be able to show people who's got what in the business um, and and you know and this says reps and warranties when you go through the process of raising money there will be documents you'll sign that ultimately are saying I haven't everything everybody that's got stock is listed here and and you know people are ultimately afraid of hey I made a commitment to Joe that if he brought me that account I'd throw him some options and if that's an email somewhere you may have inherently given somebody a stock option grant so keeping it clean that way and, and it's not just you know who's invested but what options what commitments what promises you know you, this stuff can get crazy um, <clears throat> classes of stock so so again preferred shares we've talked about um, um, but, but the biggest thing is, <clears throat> if, I'm an, if I'm an angel investor or if I'm a venture capitalist, I want to know who else owns this company. And I'm gonna, that's going to weigh heavily into how I think about it. If it's angels, I want to know those angels. I want to know their wherewithal with money. And, and sometimes if they're unsophisticated folks, um, and you know, you got a guy, I, uh, golly, I've, I've got so many horror stories about this. I, I know a business that has, um, well, I know a couple of them that have raised money from big sources of money that have 40% ownership, so they're not controlled, but they've got enough they can block anything else. I, I worked with a company one time who had, um, in fact, I wound up helping another company buy a division of this company, and they were stuck. They had a really nice little business, but they had done a deal that gave control not control exactly, but blocking ability that prevented them from raising any more money. And so they had a really successful business, but couldn't raise any money to fund it. And these guys that had this sort of blocking just didn't want anybody else in. They had their position, they wanted to defend it. And it literally paralyzed this company. And so I wound up helping another group get a really good deal on, on buying a division of their company so they could go off in other directions. Um, but, but again, Who's on your in the cap table? How many people are all? That really, really matters. Um, this is in your deck. This is a this is what a, a typical option pool distribution looks like. Um, again, I, God, I wish I had this when I was because I was trying to figure this out. But so <clears throat> you know, if you take fifteen to fifteen percent is what I'd normally, and then you divvy it up between key folks. This is a software company. Uh, largely, <clears throat> you know, this is the percentage of the pool that you could see uh, handed out to people. Um, this talks about engineers and developers. It could be 
serious salespeople. It could be other important members of the team. So this is how much from whom. This is kind of the range of things you get. <clears throat> I mean, I've seen people raise more than 100000 from friends and family, and that's fine. Um, but again, make sure you're being you're keeping in mind what that means for your family, right? If you got a rich uncle that's going to give you 100,000 bucks and that's going to set a valuation that when you go raise a real round, he's going to get pushed down, um, that, that, that you just need to take that into account. Um, angels, super angels, you know, there's all kinds of different folks out here. Atlanta Technology Angels is an investor group here that is, you know, a, a lot of people involved in that. There are people that like to invest together and create a little bit bigger capacity to do that. <clears throat> but you're in that range, it, it, you're talking less than a million bucks, you're thinking about and talking about different kinds of angel groups. Um, I say no man's land, a million to two million bucks, it's a really hard number to raise because you're not really up to the VC level and you're beyond what most um, investors can do or most angels can do, at least in this part of the country. And it's not to say there aren't those guys out there that are happy to do this. I just say they're hard to find and, um, and, and a little more unique to do deals with. <clears throat> you got all kinds of different venture guys, early stage, later stage. You know, um, uh, in Atlanta, you, most of the venture guys in Atlanta, tech operators, and thank you. I, um, that's all right, I got coffee. Well, okay. I'll be like the, now that you're videotaping me, I'm like, who was it that? in the middle of the presidential follow-up address. Um, most of the guys around town, you're going to see kind of in this range. Um, you get outside of Atlanta, you'll find venture groups that will do a little bigger. You go to Silicon Valley, they're in a whole different league. Silicon Valley is a completely different kind of model. Um, those guys make bigger bets. They're betting for, you know, they're always swinging for the fences. Um, and it's just a completely different thing. It's difficult to do a deal from here out there. They don't let, they don't go away from town very often. And so, not that you can't, and it's getting better. I mean, Google Ventures is doing deals in Atlanta now. Uh, but if you want to go to Silicon Valley, uh, I would not be surprised to be asked to stay in Silicon Valley. And I've seen companies do that too. We don't, from an Atlanta tech world, I'd like to discourage that. Um, and then when you get above the early stage stuff, you know, there are lots of companies out that are, that are private equity. They don't deal in the startup world. They deal in much later stages. And those can be anywhere from 50, 100 to billions of dollars. So, you know, you can argue that all venture capital is private equity, but not all private equity is venture capital. How it's done. So this is sort of my last slide here. Um, and it's basics, but things I didn't know. So it starts with the pitch deck. Um, again, if you want it, I have a version that's from Canaan Venture Partners that I use as the guide. Every time I do one of these, I sit down and pull that thing out. It's the, just the best guide um, I've seen. I know I've given these guys here. Uh, you, they've got more updated versions on their website, so you can go to their website and get it. Um, it is, you know, it is, it's the starting point for this. You need to be able to sit down with investors and give your pitch. It's got to be reasonably succinct. You got to hit all the kind of team and business proposition and competition and revenue model and very formulaic way to do it. Um, and then practice. And, and, and it's a crazy thing. <clears throat> um, you will, you'll get all kinds of different feedback and co comments from everybody. Um, everybody and I would do my best to take that in it gets complicated at times because you'll start to get competing views make that longer or focus on this and somebody else say don't focus on that F focus this on on this instead um, I, I will tell you that the more of it you do it all starts to kind of coalesce until you get the kind of thing down correctly um, you know when I raised my first institutional round um, I, you know, I had investment bankers help, so I went on a road trip through Silicon Valley in New York and Boston. I must have did, given that pitch 50 or 100 times. I, I equated it doing a comedy routine. I, I, got so, I got so good at it and so knowledgeable about it, I knew what questions were going to come where almost with perfect certainty and could cue them up and, and had the answers. You just got in such a routine and the comments and questions were so the same that you just um, you just kind of did it that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next thing is this financial model. So you got to have the pitch deck. 
If you go pitch somebody and they like your thing, then they're going to ask for your financial model. That's just what happens. It, it's always going to happen. They're going to even ask you for the financial model when they don't care. They're never going to look at it. That's just sort of the dance, so to speak. And it can't be, I mean, you're not talking about a PL balance sheet and cash flow with single simple statements. There, there's all the, what they want to look is how well is it thought through? How, what are the drivers? You know, how many formulas are driving headcount resources and operating costs and things like that. So, you know, hopefully you have thought that through very thoroughly. Um, and you, if you don't know how to do a cash flow balance sheet and uh, P&L, here's a gentleman right here in the middle that'll help. Uh, but there are a lot of folks that get there. You know, having that done right so the balance sheet does what it needs to do is important. Um, and you'll do thousands of meetings. You'll just do tons of them. It's just you got to go talk to everybody you can, um, and you know, go through it. And it, it, the trick to this is, and this is really important. Um, you got to find a way, and there's lots of ways to do this now that didn't really exist in my time um, with all of the pitch contests and all the competitions you have. Those are really good because it helps you really refine and tone, hone the message. Because what happens is uh, you see deal pitch fatigue or deal fatigue. If a deal's been pitched all over town and it wasn't quite ready to be pitched and then maybe a second time, it never happens a third time. So it, you know, if you don't get it right before you start talking to folks or if you're too early I mean the other thing is if you're too early and they say you're a little too early for us come back when well you know you've now laid out a model and when you said you'd get to wherever and if you didn't raise the money and you didn't get to wherever they don't really care that you didn't raise the money you didn't get to wherever and so you know it becomes harder at, at, at later stage so you got to be really careful about being ready to go out and that means get the practice and therefore do these pitch t contests and go through the various scenarios because that'll really help. Um, anybody that you meet with, ask them who else should I talk to. Ask them to give a referral. The way the venture world works, angels and venture capitalists all like to be talk to people that have been referred in and people will refer you in and a lot of times You'll be talking to somebody that you're the not right size, you're not right time, you're not whatever. You should go talk to Joe Blow over here. So take that introduction. So you can call and say, hey, Joe referred me. Get him to do it via email introduction even better. Um, ask. Um, ask, 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 ask everyone. I don't care if they think this is the dumbest thing ever since sliced bread. Ask them, well, who should I talk to to get some guidance? And sometimes they'll refer you to... Um, Maybe it's not an investor, but somebody that can help develop it further or whatever. Um, so networking is critical. Um, don't forget strategics. This is, uh, you know, so I went around, I must have pitched my business 50 times and everybody said the same thing. This is really cool, but WorldCom could do this and kill you. You don't have a chance. And then I got a chance to pitch WorldCom. WorldCom said, this is really cool. We could never do this here. And as soon as they said, we're interested, we'll write a check, everybody that said no is like wanted in as desperately as they can. So there are lots of different kind of money to be raised. So I just uh, met, and he's going to come over and guide UPS. UPS has a big venture fund. They love to invest in things. Sometimes they're just technologies they're interested in. Sometimes they're logistics or things they might serve. Sometimes they're competitive things. So Roadie, if you know that co company, UPS is an investor in Roadie. That'd be a competitive thing to UPS, but they want to they want to keep it close. So keep in mind of various kinds of companies you could think of that might be willing to invest, um, and and you think really hard about that because sometimes that's not so obvious. I, I mean, I would have never thought WorldCom would invest in us. I, I just wouldn't have, I didn't even know they had a venture arm. I've been to pitch Intel. Intel has a big investor arm. That's fun because you can't take anything in. They have security like crazy. I mean, you, laptops, phones, nothing. You go in, you get patted down, you go through walls and walls of security. Um, the other thing about strategics, there are different kinds of ways to think about doing those deals. We are here doing an investment of sorts with a company that is sort of like a note with option coverage and and in exchange for a services contract. So there's other kind of creative ways to get a business launched. I've got another customer that we're going to wind up doing the same thing. They got great revenue commitments, great 
customers, um, they just have a, a window that they can't, they need short term funding. And so we're going to create a way for them to do that. So there's lots of other kinds of ways to do it. Look outside of Atlanta. I have raised probably $200 million in my lifetime, and I have never raised a single dollar in town. There are all, not that there aren't plenty of good investors here, there are, and it's better than it's ever been, but you can go to Raleigh, you can go to Birmingham, Charlotte, Nashville. My angel round came from Memphis, from the guy that started Little John, or um, Long John Silver. He was a fast food guy and they got into technology. There are all, and Florida's flush with the ventures capitalists and they all invest in Atlanta and so it's not uncommon to see somebody announce around and nobody from Atlanta is participating in it. Um, be careful of the meaningless yes. So I'm a sales guy at heart and so what I like to do when I'm you know selling somebody is kind of go for the close and and um, and and really push for feedback and what's next steps and you really can't do that in this world. I, I will tell you almost you'll get so many folks who say this is really exciting we're really impressed with what you're doing here this is you know really really love it send us that financial model let's look at this and, and we'll get back to you and you'll never hear from them again and you can't even get to them I have I have taken a company through town here um, to help raise money and one of the funds we put I put them in front of I know the guys like one's a personal friend and I still got that from him, you know, the, yes, and, and, and now I can go talk to him about, you know, going to the next Clemson game, but I couldn't get him to respond to this deal, and it's just the way they say no. So, VCs, now sometimes they'll say no, and if, the good ones will say no, and the reasons why, and they'll give you some pointers and maybe some direction for some help, or go talk to these people instead, or come back at this time. Um, but plenty of them will just give you the, like, this is really cool, very exciting, you should be very proud of what you got going here you know, blah, blah, blah. And so a lot, a lot of yeses that mean nothing. And don't, you know, I have, I have young folks coming to have companies and they're raising money and they think they got it almost queued up because they're getting a lot of people say yes and it in the yes. It's the beginning of the process for you, not the end. This is just my two cents. So I'm already over in time. Happy to answer as many questions as you guys want uh, for a while. What is different? What, so what's the question again? For convertible note? Yes. Should we go for a discount or a cap? A cap? Do you do a cap on your uh, evaluation? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, again, at the end of the day, when it really comes down to it, you go for the best you can get. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it just like investors want you to be incented to succeed, you want them to make a good return too. And so it's a you know it's just coming to a happy medium that everybody is is. Um, I, you know I'd, I'd love to give more hard and fast statistics about this, but there's just not there isn't any. Every deal's the same, right? Someone was told me either you do it out of the back of a brown paper bag or you have something. Taking a different approach, uh, something this week, in fact, I got a call. I had a software company. It was on a pink sheet. I'll never do that again. But um, the company was uh, acquired. And the technology I still own and the patents issue. And this gentleman on third blue said, I want to run with it. I know who will put the money up. What I proposed to him was, let's just do a feasibility study. Let's put $10,000 and the two of us can split it and put together a report so we really know what we're doing here and he has a better educated opinion. I'm thinking that if you could get a person to get started on the due diligence, that you've got a greater opportunity to move to investing largely in the company, your, your opinion. Yeah, I, I, you know, Another common mistake, everybody thinks this is going to happen faster, and, and, and it doesn't. It takes a lot of time. And any, you know, when you can get a company to, anything you are prepared to do to demonstrate 
um, more credibility, more predictability, those are all good things. And to the extent you'll get uh, investors willing to really put the time and effort for due diligence, um, you know, that, that's all good. Because at the end of the thing, it's the same thing. You want to get to know them, you want them to get to know you. Hopefully, you're listening to their input and they're seeing you're willing to listen. I, I you know, um, Columbia Capital, it was one of my investors, um, and I just, those are the greatest guys on the face of the planet, and the guy, Jim Fleming there, that's now one of the senior partners, I, I know what he always liked about me is he knew I'd listen, and, and I would adapt based on the input they were giving me. And so, yeah, I, I, anything you can do to, uh, you know, because you don't want to trick somebody into writing you a bigger check when you're not really ready and that they don't understand. I mean, this is not, these are long-term relationships. And, and you, want to, you want everybody on the same page when you get into it. And, and I, I promise you, th there are dark times. I, I'll tell you, um, I, when I was first starting out, I had raised angel round, not my institutional round, and I went to uh, TER, still Technology Executive Roundtable. It's a, it's a good organization for CEOs to get involved in here. They meet now to, down at 7.30 in the morning in Buckhead. Um, Trip Rackley. Anybody know who Trip Rackley is? Not anymore. Trip Rackley had just, um, he, he exited, um, I don't remember what it's called anymore. It was a banking software business. And he, he exited, I think, in, in like in the same time, Jan, um, 99, at the very peak of the dot-com bubble. For, I mean, I don't think they were doing five, six million in revenue and they exited <laughs> a quarter billion dollars or some crazy number. Um, his CFO, uh, later was my CFO, and is a friend of mine to this day. Tripp got up and kind of gave his presentation of his history. Now, Tripp has gone on to do two other deals um, that were also crazy successful. The guy's got the Midas touch. Um, and all the story was about all the trials and tribulations and how they almost failed here and almost hit the wall there and ran out of money here. It was, and I'm kind of going, Wow, that was an exhausting story. And I, of course, I'm young and getting ready to go do all this stuff. Just uh, two weeks ago, I went and saw uh, another CEO thing up here, and it was um, what's his name that ran Silver Pop, and who's he's a guy I've known kind of through the circles in town, and he told the Silver Pop story in more detail I've ever seen, and and it was all about the you know crushing challenges that almost wiped them out and you know he's written, writing a book it sounds like about all these you will go through incredibly horrible things <laughs> it's just the truth and so you want investors that are going to be there to support you because you, you know you don't want them you want them to know what they're getting into and you want to know what you're getting in with them and um, the better you're all you know on the same page the better and whatever it takes to do it Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, how do you value IP in, 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 in issue patch, patch by four? It's really hard. I mean, I first of all, I'm not. I don't have a lot of depth in that. None of the business I've ever had were we had anything meaningful in terms of IP, um, and it is uh, you know it, it it is absolutely helpful in getting investors more credible um, but it also depends what the IP is I mean there's patentable IP that is um, what and there's just IP I mean I, I can I build telecom companies that had done integration and things like that that's not patentable patentable or we didn't know enough about it to patent it but was very difficult to replicate there are partnerships that can be in fact I'll go back to trip Rackley trip Rackley created a business that was doing um, uh, wireless, uh, they were doing mobile banking before mobile banking really got done. They sold that business for $120 million to, uh, no, it was, it's uh, chip guys. They didn't have a dollar of revenue. All they did was created relationships that they signed up with the banks and the cellular providers that gave them exclusivity. He had nothing. I mean, there was no revenue. And my CFO was the CFO there too, and he went on with the business. And I had drinks with him one night, and he was leaving from a couple of glasses of wine to go home to jump on a conference call. And they were shutting the rest of the business down. That was 
um, had been op never really turned into anything. So there's all kinds of different IP. Yeah, um, and, and it just it depends. There's also kind I've seen all kinds of businesses that have patents too, and the patents are worthless. Yep. Investors. So what I did was I went to a high dollar law firm and I paid them to give me a letter of opinion that the likelihood that the patent would be issued. And that was enough to get the investors on board. Yep. So that, that, if, you can, if you have utility patents on things, that, that's, that's a meaningful asset. It really is. They're expensive to get too, which is part of the problem. We had one for our one business, five and a half years, two hundred grand. Yeah, see, it can be. And, you know, <clears throat> um, if you're lucky, you have college buddies that became lawyers that can do some of these things. Whether you're friends or families or neighbors, they got to know what they're doing. Though patent stuff is a unique discipline. All right, I'm way over time. Any other questions? I'll give you one more if anybody wants one. All right, anybody, uh, so here are my cards. If anybody doesn't have my contact information and would like it, help yourself. If you want, um, if you want either the, um, well, I'll say the Canaan deck if you want it, or if you want a um, uh, convert uh, term sheet, I'm happy to share that. And then happy to share any other opinions, or if you've got any questions, let me know. Yep, just email me. Email me, I'll send it back. All right, thank you very much.